So today we continue the big quit. That's been the uh, theme uh, for this year. You know, January is always one of those times where we take stock of what's actually happening and we think, what do I need to quit in order for me to take on what God has for me for this new year? And uh, Colin shared with us, uh, you know, quitting old mindsets. And Pastor John last week reminded us that we need to quit destructive comparison. You know, I think that was a very, they're very apt um, points that we need to be able to quit this year. And in order for us to take a hold of 2020 and 2022 and what I believe God has for us, we need to also quit wayward trust. That's what I'm going to be sharing about today. Quit wayward trust. Now, let me start off with this uh, story and let me just encourage you, us preachers, when we give you stories about what's happening in our personal life and so on, we give you perspectives that, guess what, we're just men and women like you, trying to do the best for God and, and God is at work in us and in our families and we go through highs, we go through lows, just like you, it's okay, all right, so let's, let's see this out, no judgment today because I'm going to be sharing a few personal things, no judgment. So who here thinks they're a good driver? Raise your hand. Most of us will say we're good drivers. Did you know it's actually a psychological phenomena that we believe when we get in our car, we all believe that we are better than what we actually are and we believe that we are better than everyone else on the road. That would be a true thing. We all think that. Now, it's safe to say that as a rev head, I think I'm a very good driver. But many, many a times, God has humbled me in that area. And um, my inflated driving ego took a hit a few years ago. And let me paint a bit of a picture. So we're going to a family friend's birthday party. And we all get into, we're going into the garage to get into Jana's car, which I was driving. All five of us, we rush in and we, we're doing a, a, you know, the mad rush to get in there. We were running a bit late and there was a bit of a conversation that started in the house and, you know, continued into the car. And it's safe to say that when I got into the car, I had a bit of a verbal war with someone in the back seat. Now, my three kids are there, so if I look in that direction, you won't know who. <laughs> but let's just say it was a tense conversation and Daddy had to try and usurp his authority, make sure that it was right. But at, this, at that moment, I put the car in reverse while I'm doing one of these. <laughs> Has anyone ever done that? Is, come on, let's be honest. Confession is good for the soul. Any parents been distracted while they've been driving? Yeah. Ah, very good. We do have some truthful people here at Encompass. It's fantastic. So... As I'm doing one of that, the car's reversing. And I forgot that my other car was parked off to the side in the driveway. So as I'm reversing out of the garage, guess what I did? I sideswiped Jonna's car and my car. How fantastic is that? Two cars in one incident, both owned by me. Very humbling moment. You see, the trust I had in my good driving was wayward at that moment. I was distracted. I was somewhere off with the fairies encouraging my kids to do the right thing. You see, I'm sure if you had measured my uh, blood pressure at that moment, it, the machine would have blown up. <laughs> but I had misguided trust in my ability to drive at that moment. I had wayward trust. So the question I ask us today, and I believe the Holy Spirit wants to encourage us here and online today, is this. Are there things that you are trusting in? Are there things that I'm trusting in that are wayward right now? Things that we've placed our hopes and our faith in that are a bit shakily, shaky, a bit wobbly, and really cannot be trusted. Have you got some trust and in your own skills or abilities or feelings at the moment? Have you got some trust in leaders and government? Let's not go there. Job security, health, family, friendships, school, uni, or even your bank balance. Have you had trust in those type of things and they've let you down recently? I think we'd all say yes. 
And as we head into 2022, good and proper, we're now midway through Jan, I believe that while we've heard this verse many times in Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6, we've heard this so many times as Christians, and I believe we need to, it becomes a little bit harder when we're trusting in things incorrectly. The word says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. See, when our trust is misguided and wayward, it's, it's very easy to forget that. We're, we're placing our trust on other things, on other people, when our heart and our trust needs to be on the one who is eternal, on the one who will never fail, on the one who loves you than, more than anyone else. You see, we're experiencing different friend dynamics at the moment, different family dynamics. We've been isolated for so long and getting back together has been a little bit awkward. We've got uncertain future parameters. There's gaps in our works. I mean, in our teams, I'm hearing from many people that everyone is playing the chess game continually. You know, there are gaps, families being hit by COVID and having to resource and move people around. Guess what? It's happening in our churches as well. It's happening wherever we turn our heads at the moment. There is so much angst, but we need to put our trust on a firm foundation. We need to put our trust in God. And today, I want you to repeat after me, I quit wayward trust. Come on, say it. You've got, to, you've got the mask on, so you've got to project a little bit more. I quit wayward trust. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you are here. And Lord God, it is your word that transforms lives. It is your heart, Jesus, that will be spoken today. And I pray that, Lord God, we would walk out stronger and built up in our trust in you today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So to further put this uh, story to light, and again, remember I said no judgment, yeah? I'm going to take you just really quickly back to my teen years, when I was uh, 14 years old. I got saved and came into a faith in Jesus when I was um, about 13. Mum started dragging me along to church, dragging me by the ear, as every good Italian mother used to do back in those days. And I used to go to church, and it was more like just an opportunity to catch up with friends. But I had my own encounter when I realised that, hey, you know what, I'm a sinner, I need Jesus, and I had that moment and accepted him in my life. And my first birthday as a Christian, one of my friends bought me a gospel album. And this album I played at nauseam, and I've uh, asked the guys to put it up on the screen. It was, <coughs> it was a band called Striper. Okay, no, is that not coming up? All right, we've got some images. Anyway, it's a band called Striper, and they were one of those glam... 80s heavy metal bands. Can anyone remember any of those? Now, I know you're already judging me just by the looks I'm getting across the room. But one of their songs that they actually uh, wrote in that album was called In God We Trust. In God We Trust. And it's a very simple statement, very powerful. And it basically says this in the, um, in the title, in the um, actual chorus. It says, In God We Trust in him we must believe. He is the only one. In God we trust. His son we must receive. Tomorrow's too late. Accept him today. Now, for the record, just a fun fact, these guys are still going and they actually hand out New Testament Bibles whenever they uh, go and play at a band. And let me tell you, they play in pubs and clubs and they share the gospel every time. So when I'm hearing uh, these words as a kid, it just rung and rung within my spirit to saying, I need to trust in God. I need to put my trust in God. Did you know that that statement, in God we trust, also is on the American dollar bill? Has anyone seen the American dollar bill before? It's there as well. And in today's uncertainties, in your uncertainties about the coming year, is in God we trust a true statement of fact for you? Or is it just a nice motto? Or is it just a nice message that you heard Pastor Mark preach on the 16th of January, 2022? You need to make it a statement of faith. We need to make it a statement of faith and reality. 
You see, let me explain it to you this way. Trust is implicit and basically nothing works without trust. Look around the world and you might be surprised. Let me give you a couple examples. Nothing works without trust. I want you to hold your breath for a moment, not too long. don't want you passing out. But if you hold your breath, our body is innately designed to trust that when we open our mouth, open our nostrils, we will breathe in oxygen. It's trusting. It's innately wired within us that we trust the air we breathe. If you drove here today, and all of those who uh, put their hands up and said they're a good driver, you're the best driver around. You drove here today, but guess what? You put your trust in that other drivers around you would stop at the stop sign, would obey the traffic lights. You put your trust in other people, people you haven't even met. If you have flown in a plane, if you have been in a train or a bus, you put your trust in the pilot. You haven't had them over for dinner. You don't know much about them. You don't know how many kids they've got or whether they're married or not. But you put your trust in a pilot that you've never met to fly you from A to B. When you go to a restaurant, when we go to a restaurant, we put our trust in the chef and in the wait staff that we are going to get our meal and it's not going to give us food poisoning. We put our trust in things and people around us. It's necessary as it fuels everything we do. And as believers, bought with the precious blood of Jesus, can I hear an amen? Amen. As believers bought with the precious blood of Jesus, you and I have a part to play. And when we can play that part with a trust in God, we can be stronger than ever before. We can do what God wants us to do. We can be the salt, the light that God has us to be. We need to make in God we trust a daily statement of fact. Why? Because God is unshakable. We sang it today, God is unshakable. And if God, in God we trust, isn't true for you right now, if you're feeling a little bit uneasy, it's okay, there's no judgment. Because guess what? Read your Bible. You will see many, many men and women before you and I went through moments of where their their trust was shaky. Here's a couple examples. Esther, Queen Esther, was unsure how she was going to play a part in saving her Israel, uh, Israelite brothers and sisters, her family. And yet God used her. She was shaky at that point. Jonah was, uh, had wayward trust in God at that point. When God asked him to preach to Nineveh, he ran in the opposite direction. Peter lost his moment of trust when he stepped out of the boat. He actually walked on water like Jesus did. But as the wind and waves, as he started looking around, his trust started to fail and he started to sink. Even Thomas, the disciple Thomas, who had spent three years with Jesus and hearing Jesus tell about, yes, the the, uh, temple is going to be destroyed, but it's going to rise again in three days or rebuilt in three days. He heard all this, but yet he wanted to see and touch Jesus for himself after the resurrection. You see, if you're on shaky ground and feeling a little bit where your trust is wayward, it's okay. God still loves you. God still has a plan for you. And today he's asking you, place your trust in me again. Place your trust in me again. You see, in practice, we place our trust in others by five simple things. They're, well, simple, but they're quite, uh, quite uh, powerful in, the, in their attributes. Let me give you these examples. When we build trust in people, it is built by their character. It is built by their capacity and capability. It is built by their motives. It is built by their understanding and their track record. When we see those five things in actions, we think, yeah, okay, because of that person's character, yes, I can trust them. They've got a proven track record. Their motives are pure. Yes, I can trust them. So this morning in the time we have left, and to help you and I quit wayward trust. Let's look at five things, these five things that can help us revive our trust in God. Are we ready? Okay, number one. The first one is remember God's character. Remember God's character. Numbers 23 verse 19. Now the verses are up there. So if you want to, feel free to uh, read them together. 
Let's read them out aloud a bit. You know, if you want to read some of the portions, go for it. It's a good way to engage with God's word together as a family. It says, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? I could stop my sermon today and that's enough for us. Right here and now, God's character. Let's remind ourselves, remember God's character. He is flawless. Some of the reasons we see there, we just capture God doesn't lie. He doesn't change his mind. When he says something, he acts on it. If you look through the word, the reason why Jesus came from heaven to earth was because in the Old Testament prophecy, God spoke that a saviour would be born in Bethlehem. And guess what? It came to pass. God spoke that that, uh, um, he would send his son to die on the cross, that he would be wounded for our transgressions and by his stripes that we would be healed. Guess what? It happened by Jesus dying on the cross. His words matter. When he speaks, when he makes a promise, he keeps it. Our politicians, you and I, leaders across organisations, we can fail. We can lie, we can bend the truth, we can break our promises, but God does not. God does not. Things around us so far may not look like we were expecting. I think many of us, as we were heading towards the end of the year, were thinking, oh, it's all good, it's okay, we can now party, we can go do this, and then this wave hit us and think, oh my goodness. But guess what? Let's trust in God's character. Let's take a step back. Let's quit wayward trust in everything else and everyone else around us. Let's put our trust in God. I can quit wayward trust by remembering God's character. What else can we do? Number two, remind yourself of God's capability, God capacity and capability. You see, in Exodus 15, verse 6, let's read this together. It's a short one. Come on, read it out aloud. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, smashes the enemy. Now, I shared this example a a few times because it's just vivid in my heart because I can remember doing it as a kid. You know, particularly boys, we're a little bit more competitive. Can anyone remember playing the game or seeing kids play the game is, my daddy is stronger than your daddy? Yeah? See, my dad was a concreter and he used to have some muscles on him. And I used to say, my dad's stronger than your dad because he can carry a wheelbarrow of cement. That's, That's a tough Italian thing, you see. But you see, we need to remind the devil that our God is better than him. We need to get into that frame of God and say, my God is bigger, is stronger is more loving, is more powerful. My God is. My God is. My God is better than you, Satan, because he loves me. My God is better than you because he has good plans for me. My God is better than you because he's forgiven me. He's washed me. I am whiter than snow in God's eyes. We need to say it in our mind. We need to say it to the devil and keep trusting in God. God can be trusted because he has the, cap- the capacity and capability to smash the enemy. You see, when Jesus came from heaven to earth and he, def- he defeated the devil on the cross, guess what? The enemy smashed. Smashed forever and a day. The devil might try to wield some, uh, some of his powers right here and now, but guess what? We know the end of the story. He is already defeated and you and I can walk victorious because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. God's capacity and capabilities are unsurpassed, unmatched, now and forever. You know, we see it in creation. In Nehemiah 9.6, and let me read this out out to you, it says, You alone are the Lord. You made the skies and the heavens and all the stars. You made the earth and the seas and everything in them. You preserve them all and the angels of heaven worship you. Guess what? 
It was God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit who spoke the world into existence. Through their word, bang, light came. The sea, the earth, no one else, nothing else has the capability and power of our God. Come on. No one has that capability or capacity. You and I can maybe create little things. We can do things around us, but not on the magnitude and the scale of our God. God created the heavens and the earth. Everything in the universe was placed there by him. We can trust God. We can quit our wayward trust by reminding ourselves of God's capacity and capability. Three more. We got three more. Number three. We can revive our trust in God today by recounting God's motives. Again, famous bumper sticker verse. We've read it, heard it so many times. Jeremiah 29, 11, read it with me. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Read it out loud. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. You see... The plans God had for us through Jesus Christ. You see, it is proven that God loves us because of what he did with Jesus. He saw sin come into the world and he did something about it. He came himself as a man. God's motives for your life and for mine are love. They are for good, not disaster, and to give us a future and a hope. Now, a couple of years ago, just over a couple of years ago, um, we lost Jonah's mum, my, my mother-in-law, and it was a really tough time in October uh, of that year, really tough time, but by God's grace, we went through it with the love of family, uh, we went through, we, we, we were so blessed by the support and prayers of our church and our senior pastors, our church family, it was an amazing time of feeling carried when you could feel like you couldn't do it on your own. And as we were journeying that time a few weeks in, about six weeks later, we got some news um, about one of our kids, um, about Elizabeth, who was having a, uh, let's say, a medical issue that needed a significant time to repair. Now, one day, I'm sure they'll, you know, you'll find out more details. It'll be our own testimony, but let me give you this perspective from a parent's point of view. When we got this diagnosis of what she was going through, it floored us. It's safe to say Jana and I can remember for a week not being able to speak to each other about it. I was angry with God. Can I be honest? I was really disappointed, hurt, thinking, God, why? Why at this critical time in my daughter's life does she have to go through this? She's a young woman. God, do it to me, not to her. Father's heart, yeah? Parents' heart. Do it to me, not to her. I was frustrated and hurt. And I'm thinking, God, why are you doing this? I can't understand it. She doesn't deserve it. And yet, a few weeks after the, the first lots of treatment, as we were going through, one day we were driving home from the city. And I look in the rear vision mirror. We were playing at that time. You know, if you remember, you know, uh, Waymaker was one of our favourite uh, church songs. And we're playing that song and Jenna and I could just see the, the pain and discomfort she was going through. We're driving home. I look in the rear vision mirror and there she is, eyes closed, battling the pain and worshipping God. And it was at that moment that I believe God dropped in my spirit Mark, I'm doing a work in her. And for me, can I tell you as a dad, I would have rather God chop my leg off than to see my daughter go through that. And I'm sure there are moments in your life where you have thought to yourself, God, why? God, why? Do it to me. Do it to me. Don't. Why are we going through this? We've seen through that journey over the past few years, she's found God for herself. She's got her own faith, not on mummy's and daddy's word, not on mummy and daddy's revelation, but she's found it for herself. So church, 
God's motives are good. Even in this silly pandemic, God's motives are still good. They're still good. Even though you might be thinking, why in your frustration and anger? As I said, guys, it's okay. God can handle us being hurt and disappointed. He's big. He can handle it. He can handle it. But go to God. Place your trust in him. I can quit wayward trust by recounting God's motives. Number four, what else can we do to revive our trust in God? Is we can re-educate ourselves or yourself about God's understanding. You see, as I was alluding to even in the last point, Hebrews 4.15 says this. Let's read it out together again. Let's get God's word in our spirit. He understands humanity. For as a man, our magnificent king priest was tempted in every way, just as we are, and conquered sin. You see, throughout history and even more recent in media and so on and even in art, God is depicted as this faraway being, this deity on a throne, almost like a puppet master and just doing things and saying things. And we're just reliving the tale. No, that is not the case. That verse shows us clearly that God was interested enough that he sent Jesus as a man. And when we read the Gospels, we see Jesus himself was tempted but did not sin. We see Jesus got angry. We see Jesus cried. We see Jesus felt compassion. Jesus had every emotion that you and I feel. So he's not far away. He understands us. He can carry us through. And guess what? When we experience joy, he's experienced experienced it before and can sympathize with us. When we experience sadness, he's experienced it before and can carry us and sympathize with us. You see, he has felt everything we've felt. He's not off in the distance. He is ever present in your time of need. In my time of need, he is right here, willing and able to be able to be there for you and I. I can quit wayward trust by re-educating myself that God understands me. And the final one is we can relive God's track record. Psalm 119, verse 89 to 90. Standing firm in the heavens and fastened to eternity, fastened to eternity is the word of God. Let's read this next sentence together. Your faithfulness flows from one generation to the next. All that you created sits firmly in place to testify of you. Whether you choose to believe it or not, God has a proven track record. He is about changing lives. And guess what? He just hasn't changed your life today. He has changed and saved lives from generation to generation. When God came as a man in Jesus Christ, the disciples experienced him. And guess what? From that point in time, a wave of salvation came across the earth. A wave of mercy came across generation to generation. God has a track record of devoted believers, not only in Australia, not only in Melbourne, not only in Bandura, Mernda or Craigieburn. He has devoted believers across the globe. You know, we went out to dinner with some friends and uh, they were showing us this uh, this church in Hungary and what God is doing there. And it's just beautiful to see that across the globe, God's spirit is moving. His track record of love and changed lives is happening day after day after day. His love has reached out and will continue to reach out. And I'm going to give you some homework. I'm going to give you some homework today. Today, after church, if you hang back and have a coffee and go out into the foyer, I'm going to encourage you to do one thing. Or even if you don't do that, maybe over lunch, maybe over dinner with your family, just sit there and why don't you share a testimony 
about God's track record in your life. Do it. Tell your kids about that time that God came through in your finances. Tell your kids or your family, your friends who you might be talking to about that time that God healed you miraculously when the doctors said it couldn't be done. Whatever it may be, talk, speak it out. God has proven himself to you. Share it. It will lift your faith and it will lift the faith of those around you. Can I ask that we stand? You see, through the de- the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you and I can quit our wayward trust and we can truly place it in God, in a man who has a track record of power, of love, and of grace. You see, we know the Gospels, and I can tell you if we were to do a live roaming mic about moments where we know Jesus has changed us. We would be here for a while. But look around. There are lives that have been changed and saved by the power of God. You see, because they've put, we've put our trust in Jesus. He is a man of good character. Jesus has mind-blowing capabilities and capacities. Jesus' motives for you and for me are pure and good. Jesus understands you and he has a track record of changed lives both here and now and forevermore. So right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to put this challenge out to you and I believe the Holy Spirit is here and he wants to change you from the inside out. He wants you to quit your way would trust in the things that are fallible, that are temporary, and the things that you can just see. He wants you to put your trust in Him who is eternal, Him who is unshakable. And if that is you right now, for the first time, if you sense, yes, I've been putting my trust everywhere else, but I need God. I need Jesus. With every head bowed, every eye closed right now, we're in a moment where heaven and earth are colliding and it's a, it's, a spirit, it's a spiritual time. It's a time where God is reaching out to you. If that is you right now, just raise your hand across this auditorium. If you're uh, online, just place your hand on your heart as a sign of, yes, I need God in my life. On the count of three, just place it, raise your right hand so I can pray with you right now. One, two, three. Three, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Right now, let's pray this prayer together. Right now, we're praying it to God. Dear Jesus, today I quit wayward trust and I place my trust, my hope, my faith, In you, Lord Jesus, wash me clean of my sin. I thank you for dying for me. And today, I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, let's praise God. Let's praise God. For those of you that raised your hand, we definitely as a church want to be able to help you do your faith life. Not alone, but with us. We want to be able to help you on that. There is a Next Steps card on your seat. Feel free to grab that. Head out to the um, Next Steps foyer, uh, the hub in the foyer. We have a Bible. We have a free gift that we want to put in your hands. We want to be able to help you and support you. So can I close with this? I quit wayward trust and to just seal it in our spirits I've just asked the worship team to sing in God we trust now I would have had them do the the striper version but I don't want you walking out with your ears too sore 
But this version says, Now in God we trust, in His name we hope. And I know God will not be shaken. God is here with us. He's already won. And I know God will not be shaken. Let's sing that together as a sign of faith.